Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Horn Camp Connect live from KBHC. This session today will uh, highlight a faculty member, Patrick Hughes, and then feature a warm up with the illustrious Bernard Scully. As always, before we jump into the session, yeah, illustrious. As always, before we jump into the session, we do Zoom housekeeping items, which I feel like you all can probably recite with me at this point. So we'll just zoom right through those. So that everyone's able to hear the presentation, we've muted all participants. Please stay muted for the duration of the session unless someone asks you to unmute. If you click on participants at the bottom of the screen, you should see a participant list pop up with your name at the top. If the name associated with your Zoom account is different from your own first and last name, please click on the more button by your name, select rename and enter your name. If you'd like to include your pronouns, which I finally remembered to do today, uh, please go ahead and do so. If you click on chat at the bottom of the screen, you should see the chat box appear. Comments posted in the chat are affected by the drop down menu above the text box. Depending on your selection, your comments may be viewed by everyone or by individual participants. Each time that you enter a comment into the chat, please double check your selection so that your comment is seen only by your intended audience. And with that, I will just about hand things off to Bernard. Morning, everybody. Thanks for being here with us today. Welcome to day two of week two of KBHC. We are having another great week. I had a great first day yesterday. So here we go. Let's get started. Do our usual limbering up, stretching. After teaching for a week and a half so far, my body's a little bit tight for sure. So these are gonna be helpful to me. Uh, we'll start with our normal twisting. We'll do 10 of these. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, now we'll do the fold over, which is touch your toes or as far as you can go. One, two, three. Side bends. Take your right hand, grasp it with your left. Get a little extra stretch with this. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's go that one. Now take the right hand, grasp your left. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. Now we're just gonna relinquish some of our lactic acid that can build up in this area sometimes in the morning or during the day. So we're gonna do our arm rotations, start backwards. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And now we'll go forwards. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now we'll do finally our shoulder shrugs, which is sort of like giving ourselves a neck massage in the morning. Do backwards first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we go forwards. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, now we're gonna do some breathing. Um, we get our in outs today up to 12. So I'll turn our metronome on at 60. Here we go. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna do, oops, I don't want four, I want only ones. There we go. Okay. So you can use your hand if you want on the inhalation and on the exhalation. Thank you, Elizabeth. So do three, six, four, eight, five, ten, and six, twelve. Ready? One, two, ready. Go. Good. I'll do 
four, eight. Two, ready, go. Good. I do five, ten. Two, ready. Finally, six twelve. We're on six. We're going to be totally full up. Two <clears throat> ready. Go. Good. <clears throat> now we're going to do three sets of our capacity breathing. So <clears throat> that's the inhalation. And we're going to top it off with two more breaths. We're going to blow out with some hissing. So one of them looks like this. Every last bit of air. Ready? Let's do it. <clears throat> two. Ready? Okay, ready for first notes of the day. Turn off my metronome. <clears throat> okay, you can just choose one of these nice, easy notes at the front of it. Oh, remember to be relaxed. I talk to my students a lot about having initially this thing called a sleeping face. So it's totally relaxed adding any tension and we just add what we need and we start playing the syllable ooh or ah ooh can help us keep forward and warm the sound um let's start with some free buzzing so just wherever it's easiest <clears throat> good and now we'll do a mouthpiece same thing wherever it's easiest I would always take those big breaths. Now I'm just going to do an air attack on the horn, see what comes out, and try to make it more what I want as I hold it. So. you want right away take whatever time you need with it remember fall in love with your sound before you go on to the next exercises okay hopefully you got a sound you're happy with um, if you're not feel free to keep working on that we're going to reinforce what we did now with the ho do do exercise <clears throat> turn my 60 beats once again remember you can Stay on the F horn for an extra challenge with this if you want. Water out here. <clears throat> okay, do an air attack and a legato tom. One, two, ready. <laughs>
Sing it first if the frog in my throat <coughs> will go away for a moment. So the first note. And the words are Funga Lafia Ashe Ashe, if you know the song. Anybody who's in choir probably is singing this song. Here we go. <coughs> Two. Three. Funga Lafia Ashe Ashe. So let's play it in the mouthpiece the same way we just sang it, the energy and vitality. Ready? One, two, yeah. <laughs> So if you want to 
this, meaning like compose or improvise, um, I suggest with this one, it's in a nice pentatonic scale. You know what that is, it's five note scale, just the notes of the piece. Like a lot of songs are in pentatonic scales. And just take that sonority and just play around with it. You know, like take the notes, distill them, C, D, E, G, A. So the tonic note at the start is going to become the leading tone of the next bar. So. So it sounds like this. Tonic becomes the leading tone, one half step up. And over the course of the week, we'll build this a little more each day. Let's try it. One, two, ready? That's all it is. And start where it's easiest. If that's not a good place for you to start, then you can start somewhere else, a little higher, lower. Uh, now, mouthpiece sirens, we're going to build a little bit on what we did yesterday. The goal of the week is we're going to build over the entire range with this. So we're going to try to get all the sound we can in these octaves. So <clears throat> I'll do once for you to get the idea. Like that's all the sound you can. It's kind of like if our range is a shirt with wrinkles in it between the breaks. This is a way to kind of iron out the shirt and gain evenness. Let's try it together on a C. Two. Good. Now we're just going to add a G, just a fourth down. <clears throat> like that. Simple as that. All right, now we're moving on to our harmonic series. We're going to add uh, two more notes. We're going to add the ninth and tenth partial to our series. I'm gonna go a little faster than yesterday. Probably Jesse did 60. Um, I'm guessing I'm gonna do like around 72 with this, just as we add some notes to um, make sure I have enough breath power to get through. So remember with these, you know, we really wanna be focusing on our air, the same way we were with the free buzzing and the buzzing. Have to be solid air strain. I mean, we wanna kind of bump the notes in place. Also, one thing you can do is you can do a half whistle to get a sense of what your um, syllable does, what your tongue does as you go up and down the register. Let's just do that real quick, I'll show you. So the whistling is, half whistling is like that. So if I do a half whistle on this, Here, you know, the, the tongue is moving like this as I go up, and then it goes down like that as I go back down. So that has to happen when we're playing on the horn as well. The other thing to remember is to bump the notes in place um, as so. You know, just make sure that you're 
the air is front and center and the face is releasing just to capture the sound. <clears throat> okay, let's try it. One, two, three. Slurring. 
So I'll just start on the eighth note to show you what it sounds like. <laughs> So with this one, I'm going to go back to 72. It's a pretty good tempo. I normally, if I do the whole section of uh, set of leads, I might go even up to 80 just to be a little quicker with it. But when you're starting, 60 is a good tempo, 72. That's where we're at. Starting once again on the C, where the goal is to start to build down to the G <coughs> um, to get some more range in this. Stay in the F horn if you want. Um, also, feel free to sing these stuff. Or melodic studies. I was telling somebody the other day, you know, if you get bored with these studies, and nobody done them a lot, feel free to change them. You know, if you like, you know, jazz and pop music, you can just place the eighth note. <laughs>
just learning through the G on the F block. So cover a lot of ground there. We'll build more tomorrow. Moving right along. Now we got our chromatic scale, and we're going to expand on this a little bit by turning it into eighth notes. I'm going to start at 60 with this, and then we might do this one or two times um, just to try different speeds. Um, and the first time we're going to do it is actually only on the F side of the horn. This is just to learn our fingerings, and then we do it only in the B flat side of the horn, just to learn our fingerings, because oftentimes we don't maybe know all the fingerings for just the B flat F side. So that's right, you choose your articulation. Um, I'm going to do more of a ta on this one right now, and the next one I'll do more of a da. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> throat. A little frog in your throat needs some water. Thank you. <laughs> I do love talking. A lot of playing at corn camp. That vocal cords are saying, what are you doing? <clears throat> <laughs> All right, so we're doing um, the chromatic scale, F horn. My articulation is going to be about. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> so, everyone, uh, you can hear me through the Oops, yep. turn off your matching up. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, everyone, if you have any questions for Bernard, please go ahead and put them in the chat and I will direct them directly towards Bernard. If Correct. not, we can just listen to more music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I did have one question myself, and that was how do you come up with the songs of the day? What makes you think? pick certain ones and where do you kind of glean those from? That's a good question. Um, well, in the past in the camp, you know, prior to the pandemic, we normally I would just say, hey, well, what's your favorite song, you know, to somebody in the group? And they'd say, oh, it's, you know, Hey Jude by the Beatles or something. I said, all right, let's play that. So I sort of figured it out and we've all figured it out. But yeah, it's a little hard because, you know, not everybody can just figure out songs. You know, um, I, sometimes they pick a song I, I don't know. So it was a bit of a crapshoot, and I would oftentimes end up just saying, well, let's play Twinkle Twinkle, you know. So when the pandemic hit, and then I couldn't even do that because we were online, I just took the liberty of choosing songs that were, I felt, very playable. Um, but also for me, I, you know, I like to learn new things every day, you know, and so uh, there's a lot of music. I mean, I don't know much of anything, really, but I like to learn as much as I can, and I wanted to start to explore um, different music of the world uh, and see if I could get some of that going because oftentimes we might spend 
only in time with music that we're familiar with, which is fine, you know. But I just thought, hey, I'm creating this, you know, doing it this way. I'm just well, that's how I'm gonna do it. So I just went through different cultures and uh, found what I felt were very singable, playable songs that might even be familiar to you, like the Funga Alafia. I'm guessing some people have probably sang that in choir or heard it. It's a very popular song. Um, just to get some, you know, kind of cross-cultural things going. Um, and it was things that I liked. I, I really wanted to include, you know, be as inclusive as possible of as many cultures around the world as possible. I mean, obviously the six days we didn't want to do so much. Like this week, uh, we're having another Ukrainian song. So I you know, wanted to do that to show us sort of support for Ukraine. And also I realized I didn't know Ukrainian music very much, you know, so I got to learn these really beautiful songs. Hopefully you enjoyed the one from last week. And there's one I think tomorrow we have one or the next day. Um, so just it's kind of a kind of a selfish on my part to learn new music that I don't know, and also to share music maybe that you don't know, but also very you know this stuff is great to kind of broaden the, the oral palate. Um, you know we get a lot of this pentatonic kind of quality. We had a, a Japanese lullaby last week, which was you know it was fairly challenging to sing. Didn't look that hard, um, but all that stuff just builds your musical mind and broadens your um, skills. Uh, so that, that's kind of how I chose. It, it wasn't really any really specific thing, but it was more of those kind of large ideas. Sure. Yeah. Makes sense. And I think it's, you know, without getting too much into a really heady conversation with uh, world music versus just simply Western music, I think that's a really cool thing just to get kind of a little bit more experience there. So thank you. Well, another thing I want to do definitely, and hopefully you notice it, each week is include some music, um, indigenous music, because I don't think we get much contact with indigenous music. I have been working with indigenous groups um, this past year, and I'll be working with them next year to cross disciplinary study um, to learn their music. Um, I went to Bolivia recently um, to learn from the Aymara, who were the original um, uh, residents of Bolivia, originally pre Inca. Mm -hmm. So they've been you know, just in that region for thousands of years. And, and, you know, I just had, I, up to that point, I never had contact with any indigenous group and they're all of their musical traditions were just incredibly vast and amazing. Sure. There's different kinds of instruments. The horn normally is not part of these traditions. So I figure it's good, you know, I, I, I was a little jealous when I meet a trumpet, you know, one of my trumpet colleagues and someone has asked you like, well, you play trumpet. So what style do you play? Do you play jazz? Do you play mariachi? Do you play classical? It's like, they have all these things where it's like for horn, it's like, well, what orchestra are you playing? Or, <laughs> that's it, <laughs> yeah. you know? So I, I feel like we should be able to be, a, you know, doing other things too, you know? Right. So uh, just doing little bits of things, kind of getting us out of our comfort zone and improvising too is, you know, that'll lead to all sorts of things. And you can take those kind of sonorities and concepts and just sort of play around with them. I mean, that's to me, one of the ways we can have a genesis of new music. So that might not be music that we're familiar with and it will be tying us Connecting cultures. Kind of. Yeah, that was awesome. So that's, that's, that was kind of my initial idea behind the, the choosing of those songs. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Makes sense. Um, I have a completely unrelated question sure. from Ben, who is asking about stopping mutes. He says, I typically do hand stop notes, but I am looking at getting a stop mute. Do you have any recommendations on that front? Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's a, that's a I, I got large conversation in a different my, way. My uh, trunk, what was it that I get? Oh, what was that trunk that was that made from the 90s? Trunk what? Well, they have them too, but okay. there was another one that everyone got, though, that kind of, I don't think that they exist anymore. But trunk core is the one that I have now, and they make a fantastic stop. I'm not sure if trunk core still exists. So <laughs> I'm very good. I think, I, they do. I think they do. They do? Okay, trunk core makes, makes a great one. You can actually screw different types of bells onto the mm -hmm. stop mute. Also, I think Ian Ballou, I'm sure he makes it. So. He makes one, yeah. I have an Alexander, personally, mm -hmm. which I know you're not asking necessarily my yes, opinion. Yes, please. But I, I don't do know. Have, I, this is not my expertise. So. I'm, I'm not a huge equipment person, but yeah. I do have an Alexander one, and it, it works for me quite well. I think that just like, um, similar to hand-stopping notes being different for every person, I think mutes in general are different for every person and every horn combination as well. But those are some places maybe to start with that. I think with stop mutes, if you find a good mute maker, you know, someone like Ian or Alexander, 
Yeah. You probably can't go wrong with it. You know, I think it, it gets a little more personal with the wooden nudes mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. different kind of, and there's a lot of different colors you can go into with that. So you might kind of find yourself, well, I like this nude by that maker and this nude by that maker, or, you know, but with stop nudes, I, you know, <laughs> I, th I think that if it's a good one, you know, made by a good maker, it's probably going to be good. Yeah. So there's not a lot of difference. But, but I, yeah. <laughs> I feel like you probably know a couple of things couple about things. the horn and yeah, you know, related topics. Yeah. yeah, I can talk about it. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Bernard or anything we can answer? You can go ahead and put those in the chat if you do, and I will look at it, I promise. In the meantime, okay. um, Bernard, yeah. how was day one of week two for in person camp? Oh, it was great. It was great. My last week, I will, I will admit, I was very super excited, but I was a little overwhelmed having not done this for two years. Um, you know, it wasn't that, like full blown anxiety, but it was it was a lot of like unknowns, just kind of anticipation. Um, so I was feeling some stress at the beginning of last week, and this week I got, I got to say everything's smooth sailing. I feel great. Um, I think I've probably gained a couple pounds because I've eaten so much food. But uh, that seems like. That's what oh, we do. Car for it's good care. food. I mean, how it's... can you not eat it? They made extra cookies yesterday. Did they really? That was. Did you have those cookies? No, I missed those. Oh my gosh! They made these shortbread cookies <gasps> oh, wait, with the those. local berry like jam like stuff in the middle of it. Yeah. They right. they just and they put out like they put out a bin of them and all of a sudden they were gone and then they put out another bin of them. <laughs> I'm like, where are they coming from? Like the, like the cookie cookie uh, factory. Right. So and they were like amazing and so I thought. It's getting better, but it means it's even more like the horn camp I've known in the past. Yes. Which means 10 extra pounds. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Which is why you run triathlon, so it's fine. Yeah, I'll work it off in the summer. You know, I'll just run my bike above the mountains. No big deal. Good. All right, well, almost time for Pat, right? Yeah, it is almost time for Pat. Um, let me go see where he is. Just, if there are other questions, again, put them in the chat or comments or things you would like to talk about. Let us know. It's interview time. Oops. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming today and sticking with us. And I look forward to seeing you in two days. Jesse will be with you tomorrow. And um, so I guess we'll take a little break now before Pat comes in. And uh, maybe. Thanks so much. Oh, Hello again. Yeah, we're just taking a little break while Pat gets situated. Um, I hope everyone's doing pretty well this morning. Do you all, um, I know we have a couple of people joining us from the States. Do we have other people from other countries or particular states that you all are from? Chat, chat time. Ohio. I'm from Tennessee originally. I'm currently in New Hampshire, but normally I'd be in the South somewhere. Oh, Heidi, you're in New York. I didn't know that. Alaska solstice within the night sun. Yes, Lupe, you sent me some pictures. I should share those with everyone later, but I might try to do that in a little bit. And Pat, are you are you happy, ready to go, comfy? So happy. Okay, thanks for uh, hanging out with us just a little bit in this break time, everyone. And we'll go right to Pat. Hi everyone, Pat Hughes here. Uh, hope you're all having a good morning so far. Um, I am here at camp, it's wonderful, you need to come. 
uh, experienced the whole thing. I'm sure everyone's saying that, but I'm glad that you can uh, join us online. That's really cool. Uh, so my name is Pat Hughes, and I'm the horn teacher or horn professor at the University of Texas in Austin. And um, I just finished my 20th year there, if you can believe it. I can't. Wow. And uh, um, I'm originally from Minnesota, and so if I have a couple of drinks, which is happening late in the evenings here, the thing my oars get even longer than they than they usually are <laughs> normally. So, um, but I'm completely sober right now, just so you know. So it's, it's, uh, everything's okay. So, um, so all right. So I'm giving a talk today, and the talk my talk is called "I Know It by Heart," and um, it's a class about using the technique of memorization as a practice tool. Um, I think that after you see what I'm talking about, you'll find that it's a it's probably a different way of practicing than you're used to. And um, hopefully it will help you um, learn your music a little bit quicker, um, learn it more intimately for sure, and more than likely allow you to take to give your take on the music rather than um, um, doing all the things that you think you're supposed to be doing, but actually singing from your from your own soul or whatever. Um, <clears throat> many times when we hit problems in, we're learning a piece of music and uh, we hit a problem spot, something like we miss an interval all the time or, or our articulation is not clean. We usually use, most of us use one way to fix the problem and that is to slow things down like our teachers all told us slow it down with a metronome um, and go very slowly and make sure you go gradually and bring it up to the <clears throat> up to the tempo when i was a student i was very impatient and um, i would slow it down and i think i got it and then i would just go fast and of course that never never worked but that's usually like a tried and true way and you know sometimes that actually does work it's um they, there's nothing wrong with that approach um um, um, but you can actually be doing more than just thinking about getting the notes and getting it faster if you slow it down. And um, we're going to try to incorporate memorization into that. Did you ever have um, a chunk of, like you spent a chunk of time working something out, you slowed it down with the metronome, you did just like you teach, you went gradually, 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 and at the end, like 20 minutes later, you can actually play that phrase perfectly, and then the next day, it's like you never did any of that, and it's exactly as bad as it was the first time through. Oh gosh, that happened to me all the time. And, um, and I would, of course, as being horn players, we think it's all our fault, and that and, um, we think, oh, I really suck. You know, that's we you know that's where it goes to. It's like I can't can't play this. But instead I think we should be thinking, hmm, so I spent 20 minutes yesterday and the day before and the day before slowing it down and speeding it up. And that didn't work. That approach was not successful. So why would I put myself through that approach yet again? <clears throat> Um, and so I think, I always think, hmm, instead of like um, degrading myself, I go, hmm, interesting. Let's try that a different way. And, uh, and, and we should have more than one way to, solve, to fix our issues when, when we have a, a, a tricky spot or whatever. We should have many different ways to practice. And, um, and so that's what today's about. I'm introducing you to a way of using memorization to fix those problems. Um, and so, uh, you should have an arsenal of different ways to practice. So I'm going to talk about memorization and how it's helped me to learn music faster and learn it on a deeper level, and um, which in the end certainly increased my confidence in the performance. And um, um, and when I say memorization, the goal here is not to have the music memorized for your performance and you're going to play it without music. Um, wind players hardly ever do that. String players do that all the time. Piano players do that all the time. But wind players, we, we really are not asked to play from memory very often. Perhaps if you get asked to be in a, to play in a concerto but uh, with an orchestra, but you know, there's probably one horn for every 6,000 horns who get to play a concerto with an orchestra. So it's really not something that we need to like be able to do. In high school, they tell us it's really important. I don't know, memorization, whatever. But so this is not about um, the end result being that the performance is memorized. This is about using memorization in your practice to learn the music better so that you, you create better habits um, and that you will make less mistakes or whatever as you're going along the way. So it's perhaps a little bit outside the box. 
but um, let's go with it because that's what this is life's all about, right? So I know it by heart. That's the name of my of my talk, and um, we have all heard that expression. Oh, I know it by heart, and um, like think of your mom's face. I know my mom's face by heart, you know, and um, um, but that usually means we have it memorized, right? Um, your mom's face, a favorite pop song, the ABC song, you know, Happy Birthday. We all have those. We we can just grasp those and we can sing them immediately right and that memorization happened because we experienced it over and over and over and over and we said it over a million times we sang it a million times we played it maybe over a million times or we thought about a memory over and over and over the memory becomes um, memorized in our head and we probably told someone about it we probably added our own little um, details to stuff to stuff like that and that's and when you learn something over and over and over that's called learning by rote i'm sure you've heard that expression too. And the word rote actually comes from the Latin word rota, which is the word for wheel. And um, in this case, it means turning, going, turning the wheel over and over and over until it becomes familiar and you know it by heart, which interestingly, back in the good old days, for a long time, they believed that your brain was in your heart. So when they say, I know it by heart, um, they're talking about knowing it in, in your brain. But there's maybe there's some really interesting things to consider with the uh, entendre, double entendre of that or whatever. Maybe that's not a double entendre. Now I'm winging it. So here you go. But, um, but maybe memorization is knowing it by head, which allows us to know it by heart. You turn it around and around and around in t inside you until you know it inside and out, and then you begin to love the memory or love what it is, and you want to share it with other people. Um, my daughter, I was talking to my daughter about this, and she said, you know, it's interesting because the, the circulation system is your blood going around and around and around with your thing, so it's, so it's all like connected, I guess, on some level. But um, uh, Think of the things that you know by heart, your mom's face, a famous quote, a song on the radio, a story from your past. Why do you know it so well? And it's because it's often just more than just the words, it's the idea. And there are often feelings connected to it or another sense of another sense has, is involved in the memory, like the smell of your partner's perfume or aftershave or um, um, along with their face or a particular day when you heard a song for the first time you remember um, you remember more than just the song more than one sense is connected and you're emotionally tied to it I am an absent-minded professor and I lose my keys at least twice a day and so I've I've had I have elaborate ways of where I should put my keys every time I go in the house, but of course I never do. But um, um, but one time I was putting my keys and um, it, it fell behind the the place, and then I leaned down to pick it up, and then I bumped my head really hard. It was really <laughs> stupid, but now I will never forget where my keys are because of that. Because I remember that okay, you actually did put the keys there. So all right, so um, so there's an emotional aspect to it that and so um you know it so well that and you've listened to it so well or you've told it so well that you recognize even a small part of that story out of context it will trigger the whole memory so um performing i believe is just like telling a story we always say it's about communication right and um, um if you think about a story, a personal story, something that happened in your childhood or even a few days ago, it could be something funny or something traumatic or where you learned a lesson. Um, you already know that story by heart because it's your story. You don't worry about when you're telling it, you don't worry about getting the details correct because it's your story. And I mean, no one can add a detail to something that happened to you. You're excited to share the story because it's relevant to the discussion with, or the audience that you're with. And you hope people laugh or hope people sympathize with you or perhaps to get, get to know you a little bit better um, by, by telling the story, revealing this personal story or something. So when you're telling the story, when you're telling a story, it's a performance, if you think about it, and um, you trust the details will come to you. They'll, they'll just come in your mind and you're not worried that you're going to forget something because it, it's only your story. You're relaxed. You're yourself. 
Um, you're improvising the words for the most part. I, you know, if you have people tell to, that something that happened to them two days in a row, they'll use different words, but they'll get the same idea across. They're improvising, if you think about it, improvising their words, and they're naturally putting in pauses and they're raising their voice for a punchline, or they're hesitating for dramatic effect. Um, and and you, if you're telling a story, you probably use your hands, you know, to, to emphasize everything. And for sure, there's facial expressions. And I've been accused many, many times of having way too many facial expressions when my students are playing. Sometimes I'm just sitting there and they turn and they go, what? And I was like, ah. I was just sitting here and they're like, no, your face. So, um, <laughs> but your goal is to communicate your story, right? So in, in performance, it's more, more like an improvisation, but you know, you have the bullet points um, that, and you know, they'll tr you trust that they'll come to you. Emotionally, you're probably enjoying the story. Like I'm enjoying talking to you guys right now. And, um, and you're refreshing your memory as you go along. And you're not worried if you say a wrong word or skip over something because you can easily come back to it. If you left out a detail, you can go back and get there. In terms of stress, there's not much stress. Not much stress going on here um, unless, you know, I don't know, it's an embarrassing story or something, but your body's pretty relaxed when you're telling a story. Now compare that with telling a story about something that didn't happen to you or, um, where, or the plot line of a movie that you just saw where you have to get the facts straight or you were, saw an accident and you have to remember all the details. Someone else may know the story that you're talking to and they may, may know it differently or, um, uh, or someone's testing you to see if you have the story right. It's important that you get the details in the right order. And at that point, you think you're being judged on some level. So it's different. There's less improvisation. The, um, a lot of your sentence end up as a question. Like, I went to the refrigerator. And someone goes, yes, yes, I went to the refrigerator. So there's, so there's not a, like a normal um, up and down that, but it's like questioning or up speak. I guess we say that when, um, when we used to do it. But you're less yourself relating the story because you're trying you're thinking more about the details when other people don't know the story they trust everything you say is the truth that um for the most part unless you're a big liar but don't be a liar um but it makes it less stressful to you recount the story if they know the story you're aware they're listening for details and perhaps there's someone in there listening for your mistakes someone might interrupt you or dispute one of the facts of the story or you told it in the wrong order or perhaps they're a bit perhaps they're just sitting there judging to see if how well does this person actually remember it um, and if they correct you if they interrupt you you experience like a tiny pang of like self-doubt right and you're just like oh, what did I do? okay so now let's make a leap to horn to performing on the horn yes this is a horn camp so we're talking about horn so what's the same when you think about performance because i think performing should be telling a story you want to communicate something you know to the audience you want the audience to understand you don't just want them to sit there and judge but so you're still telling a story in both cases you're telling a story in terms of um telling your personal story or whatever and then the music tells the story it, itself you're in both cases you're hoping that the audience likes it i guess or laughs at it or are at least entertained by it by this by the story so those things are in common with telling a story and performing but what's different the different thing is when you're playing strauss one um you didn't make up the details right and and um there's there's details about it that are not exactly always pristine so you're a little worried that some of those um details um, might be missed. You worry that you might mess up. There are parts that you don't know exactly for sure. Um, um, and you're not allowed to go back if you missed a detail in performance. That's the worst thing. And, and there's no interaction from the audience, right? You're just up there and there's this magic, like, what do they call it? The fourth, the curtain. I can't remember what they call it. What's that expression? Like, fourth wall. The fourth wall. Yeah, that you're not supposed to cross, which I think is a bunch of posh posh, by the way. So you should always cross it whenever you're performing. Talk to the audience. They want to know who you are. So um, um, yours. If you go out there and you play the piece a Mozart horn concerto, first movement, you're worried that there are people in the audience who know it better than you. 
um, your stress level is going to be higher. Um, you really want to tell the story and you're trying to tell a story, but everyone knows the story, ah, right? And so there may be audience members judging you and they're actually not judging, um, they're not judging you as a horn puller, they're judging how well you told the story. There's two different kinds of ways that they can judge you, right? Like, oh, he was a good horn player, but um, he, he totally missed the boat on that. Or like, oh gosh, she was so wonderful. And that's all you think, you know, and so you, that, you never know what the audience is going to think. But if you go back to the personal story, at the end, people are going to react to the content mostly. No one's going to say, oh, good story, but you could have said that one detail of your story a little bit better. Like, no one's going to say that. They're just going to be like, oh, or they'll ask questions, you know, and, and, um, and then it turns into a dialogue, which is way more fun than just a one-sided um, conversation or one-sided story. So um, your detail, the details of the story and the perceived outside judgment of the audience get in the way of you being yourself when you're telling the story or telling your own story, when you're performing, when you're, when you're telling a real story and when you're performing. So um, um, those are the things that we have to kind of like get through or figure out if we really want to be a great performer and really want to feel comfortable and feel like we are telling our own story when we perform. Okay, so um, now we're going to do an activity and this would be better if you're all in the same room with me, but you're not and that's okay. Um, and uh, but we're going to sing. You have to sing. No one can hear you. Maybe someone can hear you. That's fine. We're going to sing the opening part of Strauss one. I'm not a singer, but I'm happy to do this. Um, um, and so we all know it, not, not the bum ba dum part, but I'm doing the first like ba wa da dum, okay? So let's just sing that together. If you sing along with me, please sing along with me and um, um, so I know something's happening here. And so um, um, we're just gonna sing it. We're not gonna look at the music, we're just gonna sing how we remember it, okay? So here we go, one, two. Da 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 da. sounded heavenly you sounded so much better than me i'm sure all right so that's just singing it right no we're just like oh yeah i remember that tune okay now sing it with gusto sing it like you really want you really want everyone to know that you love this so i'm going to sing louder elizabeth you might have to turn the mic down no i won't <laughs> sing that loud. Um, um so here we go so sing it like, like oh like really do it still we're not looking at any music at all Okay, so here we go. Oh, one, two, three. <laughs> into it and I was um, usually I'd be alone so I know no one's judging me but you guys had to hear me sing anyway so and and um, um, Elizabeth didn't have you guys turned on so I couldn't hear you singing either so you're safe <laughs> okay so now I'm gonna throw this um, throw the music up on the screen here so um, let's see. Sorry, everyone. Oh, you're good. It's here. somewhere in here. Hello. Hello. You guys can all see what Bernard's computer looks like <laughs> right now. So. Welcome. <laughs> and what the background of there all these go. things are. So okay. there you yeah, go. It's one of these two. 
All right, so can everyone see that? There's the music, there's the music. Now I've done a tiny little bit of editing um, with my iPad and I've taken out some of those silly extra breaths, okay? So, um, uh, cause we don't need those breaths. So um, now, but I want you to look at where the breaths are. So there's a breath like in the fourth measure, right? And then a breath um, at the, uh, after that, we're gonna breathe after the C in the second measure of the second line. And then there's another breath. So now we're gonna sing it with gusto again. <laughs> But make sure you take really good breaths where those breaths are, okay? Here we go. So, oh, one, two, three. Ba -da -da -da. So that time we were singing through it, singing through it, and um, but we were thinking, making sure that we got those breaths right. Okay, now I want you to say ta every time your tongue goes down. Okay, so now we're doing the articulation. So I don't get to go bum ba da da anymore because that's not what the music's doing. So I'm gonna sing it, sing the articulation, and do the right breaths while I'm singing. And sing along with me. Ready? A oh, one, two, three. Ta 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 ta. Accent there. Ta. Um, ba, uh, ta, 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 sorry, the whole right side of my screen is you guys, so I can't actually, um, I couldn't see the articulation there. That's my fault. Okay, but anyway, so now we were singing it with the right articulations. Okay, now be musical and do the right articulations. Sing it with feeling and take the right breath and worry about the high B flat the whole time. So now I have to think about, oh God, I hope I, so that breath, <laughs> that breath before the high B flat, that better be an extra special breath and um, make sure that I really center my, my notes, my D and the measure of the high B flat that I have a great sound there to set it up. So we're gonna sing it again. We're gonna do more um, um, crescendos and decrescendos that are written. We're gonna do the right articulation and we're gonna take the right breaths, ready? Oh, one, two, three. Ta, 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 worry, 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 ta, ta. So that's what we're thinking. But so right now, ask yourself, what did that feel? How did that feel compared to the second time we sang it when we were, didn't care about the music and we were just singing from our hearts and we were singing it with gusto? That was way more fun than what we just did here. Here, we're getting bogged down by all the details that are on the page. And, and, um, and those are becoming more important. I better not miss that breath because if I miss that breath, all that kind of stuff. And so. Um, uh, you feel uh, more self-conscious, you want to make sure you get it right, and, but, and you feel less like yourself. You feel less like um, you know, yourself putting, just having fun with the music. Instead, Strauss is playing you, right? Strauss is playing you instead of you're playing Strauss. So the details, again, I'll say it, and the perceived outside judgments get in the way of you actually like singing from your heart. And so we lose sight of that emotional aspect of fun in music, even though all of our teachers are saying, have more fun, think about a love song, think about all this kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I got it. I'm gonna think about a love song. And you think love song, and then you go tongue breath, tongue worry. You know, then all of a sudden we are just thinking all the wrong things. And then we get done and we go, oh yeah, I was supposed to think the love song. I didn't do it again. 
You know, we, it's like so common that happens. It happens to me all the time. We get bogged down by those details on the page. How are we supposed to be musical? How are we supposed to sing our song if, um, if we can't get it, if we, if we don't, if, if with the pressure of actually trying to get it exactly right. And so that's why memorization is gonna work. So we're gonna, so basically it's working on a phrase or a line or an excerpt or a section or whatever um, that, that with, without using the music and trusting your own instincts about how the articulation goes and just how you remember it. But you have to kind of do some study work first before you actually, um, before you're actually able to do that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you like five steps to do this. So the first step is listen, 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 listen. Back when I was a student, they told us not to listen because our interpretation was going to be influenced by whoever we're listening. But you know what? It's good to know that there's a million different interpretations of stuff and um, you can make your own judgment if something's great. So pick a phrase or a section of a solo that you wanna work on. This doesn't necessarily have to be this, um, the hardest section or the thing that you're always missing, but it can be. And, and, um, and listen to it a number of times. Go on YouTube, um, check out Spotify, Apple Music or whatever, and just listen to a little like, you know, section, like the section that we just did. I'm not doing the whole horn concerto today, I'm just doing that opening section of the first you know, exposition part. So, and then um, listen to it enough times so that you can sing along. So, so that you actually know you can sing it. You can sing it without the music. You hear how it's going. And so, um, um, uh, so we're going to do that. So I have um, a, a little video here of, let's see, of David Cooper playing this. And it's, it's hard to find a, uh, a video um, that uh, is just with piano for Strauss, which is unless it's like a high school kid playing it. But it's kind of cool to be able to um, um, to do that. So oh wait, hold on a second. Okay, so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to the desktop, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think I got it. I think you got it. Okay, great. All right. So this is David Cooper, and we're just gonna listen to the part that we were just we were just singing. Okay, we're just gonna listen to him play it. Ready to listen? Put your ears on. Listen to listen to it all. Just the piano part 
of Strauss one. Watching the piano player play it with their hands, I'm not sure why someone decided that was important, but whatever. You can see a nice relaxed hand position if you're a piano player. But now, um, so you can watch the hands, but also we're going to listen to, well, we're not, we're not even going to hear the horn part. So you can sing the horn part along with it while you're watching the piano part. But what, look at the piano part, look at what's moving and what isn't moving, the rhythm and all that kind of stuff. So here we go. So isn't that interesting to see that? I remember the first time I actually looked at the piano part, I never realized that the bass line actually had the most interesting part of the piano part. That part, right? While I'm holding the B flat. The right hand is just doing chords. Da, 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 da. Now, if you were in Natalie's classes last week, I'm sure she probably had you like um, tap tap the rhythm of the piano. Did she do that with hers or not? Or did she do it? Oh, you don't know? I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Well, um, one okay. of Natalie Grana's things, she's on faculty here, but she's not here this week, is that you watch the piano part and you actually tap the rhythm of the piano part while you're watching the score and it keeps your eyes on the piano part or the orchestra part instead of the horn part. Because knowing something inside and out means you know the harmony, you know everything that's going on at the same time. So um, you can you can do a whole bunch of different variations of this, of like singing the horn part or tapping the left hand of the piano part. Um, um, but you should listen to it enough so that if you hear someone play it, play it or sing it wrong, you know that they made a mistake. So if I sing. Um, ba -da. Okay, that's how well you should know whatever you're going to be working on. You should know if it's right or wrong. You should be able to hear, hear if it's right or wrong. So listen, listen, listen. That's the first step. Okay, the second step is to find and note interesting stuff to you in the music. Okay, not something your teacher told you to pay attention, but because you're listening to it, stuff should stick out. So. Um, Look at the horn line and, and find stuff that's interesting in the horn line. Like, um, um, I find that when I look at the music, an interesting thing in the horn part is that, um, that there's all these extra breaths in the music and then there's a hairpin with nearly every phrase. And for me, that's kind of funny because if you write, if I as a composer write the line, ba -da, naturally going to do this without you having to try to actually do this and so so I would be like oh that's interesting maybe I don't know why that's there but I'm just going to play it naturally instead of just like, and, and let the shape of the melody or the shape of the, the volume of the melody take care of it um, so that's interesting in the horn, the horn line you can think about direction and phrase goals I thought it was so cool when David Cooper went bum ba da dum da Oh, I thought that was so neat, and that may be something that I may try to incorporate. The music doesn't really say to do that, but it was really, really neat when I heard it, when I listened to it. And you need to trust your instincts. Go back to when you sang it, and, and remember the remember the flow, and listen to the flow. Record yourself singing it, so you can hear naturally how you're singing the phrase and how the, the phrase actually goes. Because it might, it just might not be exactly what's on the page. And you know what, that's what this is about. It's okay. So think of all the possibilities. Try different things. Bum, ba, da, dum, ba, dum, or bum, ba, da, dum, ba, dum. Try them out. Maybe you think, oh, I could possibly not play at that G as sweet as David, but maybe you can. How do you know if you never tried it, right? So um, think about how your sound is gonna get you to the goals that you're going, you know, think about where the high point of each phrase is and where, okay, that's where I'm going. Am I just playing my, my sound and taking for granted the sound that my horn's getting to me to that point? Or can I do something with my sound a little bit more? Can I maybe add a little edge right at, at the very, at the, at 
the very top and then come out of my edge. Think about how you can use your sound because we all have more than one sounds. We have hundreds of sounds, right? And so um, um, think about how, you, how your sound can get you towards the goal. Think about your articulation. How does your articulation help? Like, is it a hard T? Is it a D? Are you using an N? Do you want to like avoid that tongue because it just bugs the crap out of you and you hate how that articulate that sixteenth sound? Or you just don't have a fast tongue like me and um, you're just going to have to figure something else that sounds easy. Um, so how is your articulation going to help you make the phrase, make get you to the thing? When you get louder, you have to tongue a little bit more present. It has to be more present. How are your breaths going to get you there? Um, can you go, can you take the breath that's that I marked? Ba -da 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 -ba -ba -da -ba -da and do that all in one breath? A lot of people think they can't, but I... I I would say 97% of the students that I say, just try it, they do it. And they're like, oh, I guess I can do that. Because they think they need to take a breath before a high note, but guess what, you don't have to. So, um, um, but it's, that's all about trying out, and that's interesting. That's another interesting thing that I'm finding about this thing. Um, uh, where do you get loud? Where do you, where do you not get loud? Where is really, really soft? Where can you use the B flat horn to get a really crystal clear, soft sound? Or, or where should you use the F side to get a nice, bigger sound? Um, when you have a crescendo and a day crescendo at the top of the crescendo, how long are you actually staying forte before you actually um, uh, diminuendo? I, I mean, the side, you know, it's all these little things. And then I think this is the thing that um, I like to encourage everyone to do is use theory, musical theory, whatever that means to you, because musical theory is just talking about music. It's, it's not, you don't have to know like a three phrase period followed by a blah, blah, blah. But just use the limited theory knowledge that you have to describe what you're gonna play, what's going on in the phrase. Um, not just the notes, what the music is doing. So the, uh, for, for our um, purposes, we might say like, um, okay, so um, it opens, starts on an F, and that is um, sol. It's the fifth scale degree, and it goes. It soars up an octave, and it gets louder just because you went up an octave, and then it comes down the tonic triad. Okay, so it's a B flat chord, right? And um, and then there's a breath, or not a breath. There's just a, a there. Some people put a breath, but I don't put a breath in there. And then I connect that note and go to the next phrase, which jumps up a fourth and comes down a phrase, and then there's a bump with on bar in there. So that's music theory, folks. That is all music theory, and I only use really a couple scary words like major triad. Maybe that was scary for some of you, but um, um, you know, or it came down a chord. You know, it came down a chord. It was just a, we all know what triads are. But use theory to describe what you're going to do. Then I'm going to take a big breath. And then the next phrase comes and it starts soft and it gets, you know, so, so you talk about all the things and I don't know if you've ever read the book, um, A Devil to Play or um, what's the, what's the, I, can't I found remember. my horn. I found my horn by Jasper Rees. So um, that is a wonderful book. He actually came to Horn Camp and, and uh, Candlebutt's Horn Camp and that there's a lot of them in the book about Candlebutt's Horn Camp. But um, the best part of that book for me was um, the very end when he's finally um, playing the second movement of one of the Mozart Hermitages at the British Horn Society and he's been working for a whole year to play this thing and he describes in vivid detail every thought that goes through your head while you're performing in front of the audience and it's just it's just perfect I, he put it down perfectly and it's hilarious I don't think he meant it to be hilarious but I, I was like oh my god that's exactly what it's like inside your head while you're playing. So you should check that book out. I Found My Horn is the American version and The Devil to Play, it's the same book, but it's, that's the British title. So um, there's an American title and a British title. Wonderful book, but anyway, he, but he describes not only the notes, and so you, if you know the second movement, you know exactly where he is in the solo. It's just like so well written. It's really, really cool. <clears throat> Okay, so now you've, thought, you've really gone over it and you've thought about everything, you've thought about where the, um, um, all the parts about the horn part that is interesting to you, and then um, start playing through it. Um, and note the details, note your wonderful breaths, note your preemptive strikes on the hard parts, like what, do you, what you're going to do to make sure, ready for that B flat. 
Um, where is your story when it's just when you're just playing along when you're just like going you know like are you just like going out to La La Land or are you thinking oh here's where the girl gives the other girl a flower you know like you know like where what are you thinking in those kind of in those kind of times and um, um, uh, and then I always tell everyone to think about a relaxed left hand a relaxed left hand when we wood shed, when we slow things down and speed up, usually what we do is get tighter and tighter and tighter in our left hand. So when you're going to wood shed or slow down and speed up something, always don't move the metronome up unless you played it at that tempo with a relaxed hand. You'd be surprised how that changes um, your whole the whole way you hold the horn and your whole performance. All right, so you've noted the details and now you're ready to play. Now you can get your metronome out. And what you're going to do is you're going to play your piece or whatever at a ridiculously slow tempo. Ridiculously slow so that you can remember all the thoughts that you want to put into it. This is my favorite part. Actually, my favorite part in this in the whole opening is the left hand of the piano. I think that's so cool. It's like a duet. It's the horn, the horn and the and the basses. That's the duet. The rest of people, people are just going chunk, 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 right? But that that's important too, because that sets up this underpinning of, of a constant eighth notes are running but I just love that oh, da, da, da. Oh, every time I hear that and because of that I don't get really soft on that B flat I go ba, di, da, ya, ba, di, da, da. I blow right through that because I'm just so inspired by that line that I, and that's where I'm varying from, from what's actually written on the page but um, for, to me it makes perfect sense so um, remember all the thoughts you have and the thoughts that you have are just as important as the notes you're playing. So, um, so big breath, play an F, play notes, da, 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 da. here comes a breath again, I'm going to hit it with a nice T, here's where the girl gives another girl a flower, and then here's where we get big, and here's where David Cooper did that really cool G, and so I'm going to do that. So every time you play through it at a really slow tempo, practice those thoughts as well. So you gotta nail the thoughts, thought process. You uh, you got the notes. Remember we sang it so many times that there's no way we can play any wrong notes anymore. So um, play it without the music, and then play it with the music. Go right back and look at the notes and play the same thing. Think those thoughts while looking at the music. Move your metronome up by one. Play it without the music. Think of practice thinking all your thoughts. Look at the music, play it again with the music, move your metronome up by one. So you're playing it each time, you're playing it twice, and don't pay attention to like stupid mistakes. Don't try to fix stupid mistakes, you know, it, it, um, because it, it's not about that. What the reason we're doing this is so that you get to know the music better, right? But if you go gradually enough, <clears throat> you'll, um, you'll start, you'll feel like the whole thing's moving forward, and it's not about just getting the notes right and getting those notes memorized so that when the judge is there, that you, you don't mess up. But now it's about like you really bringing yourself into the performance of, of that line. And um, remembering your phrase shapes all the time. Does it sound how you like it? Um, go back and forth, music, no music. And then when you're practicing this phrase, I mean, I would do this, I, I mean, obviously we all know this music. So this, this is something, maybe it seems ridiculous for me, but I wanted to take something that everyone knew. But a lot of times it's music we don't know. So we do have to kind of slow it down and, and check it out and, and, all the, and figure out fingerings. And sometimes we get to a certain tempo, uh, tempo and then the fingerings that we were using, maybe I should use a couple of B-flat fingerings or something like You learn as you go. But each time you're going back, you're playing, playing from memory, no memory, memory, no memory, memory, no memory. And so, and I, I think it's really important actually to play looking at the music as well, because usually when you're performing, the, the music's going to be there. And if you're just used to not pl from playing from memory and you look at the music, it could throw you off. Sometimes a whole bunch of 16th notes and a lot of accidentals um, stress us out. But um, if you practiced, you say, I can play this without the music or with, you can learn when to have your eyes leave the music and when you need to come back to check in and all that kind of stuff. So, um, um, and when you so when you're playing without the music, you gotta listen to your sound. You gotta listen to how you're filling up the room. Listen to see if you're 
if your if your articulations are projecting. Listen to see if your story is being told. You don't have to look at the music because you know it, but you can actually really hear it differently because it's you singing your song. Um, think about your thoughts, play it again, play it away, and, um, and relax your left hand. I mean, there's all these things you can incorporate into your memory. You're not just remembering the notes, you're remembering how your hand felt. You're remembering how great that breath feels or has to be um, before this stuff. Um, um, so that that all becomes part of part of you more. And I think, here's the last thing, is keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open. That's one of my hugest pet peeves. Here I am. Oh, there's only 22 of you, so, so it's not going out too well. But I guess it'll be on YouTube. But yeah. can you just imagine if I would have given this whole presentation with my eyes closed? And I'd be going, I'm so trying, you know, really hard to do this. And isn't that just weird? That is so weird <laughs> to have your eyes closed. And um, we are communicating, you know, in our facial expressions. String players, they get to move their faces all over the place. And um, I always think when I'm doing jury um, grade, the, the percussionists who play the marimba, they're so expressive that I think their music sounds more expressive or something than it actually is. But we don't really have much, we can't smile when we play unless we're doing the high range the wrong way, right? But, um, um, but, um, but keep your eyes open. And I think if, if you close your eyes for a wind player while you're performing, someone in the audience is going, oh, this must be hard. This isn't, oh, it doesn't sound, oh. And, or like, Oh, does that, does memorizing that? You know, you think all these things, and if, if your audience is thinking that stuff, you're not telling your story, you're not getting your story across, they're just thinking about your eyes closed. So practice memorize with your eyes open. I used to, um, put a, like, I would take a piece of paper and just put, draw up someone's face and then put, tape it to the wall, and I would play to that and keep my eyes open and watch the person's face. But I think that, um, I think you can communicate. Sometimes, of course, when you're like a really emotional part, you want to close your eyes for effect. And we should be able to do that just like a string player, right? But if our eyes are closed the whole time, there, it's, it's like, it's just like this. And it's so funny if you see someone who plays like that, that they're, they, um, they're playing, you know, and they're playing through with their eyes closed, and then they put their horn down and their eyes open. You know, it's like a, one of those scary dolls with their eyes open and closed, and as soon as they put their horn up, their eyes close again, and then it opens when they empty their water, and then it closes again. I don't know, that just seems so funny to me. And I feel like, I also think, like, they're afraid to communicate. They, they're, not, they're not thinking about the audience, and so, there's my last little thing I'll, I'll harp about, but keep your eyes open while you practice, then it'll be very easy to do when you're performing or when you're playing. So repetition, repetition um, uh, is really important in memory. That's the way that memories are um, ingrained in us. We create neural pathways. Um, lots of listening, lots of listening, and then find your story. It's okay if you have to change your articulation. No one really cares um, if you're playing something at church and you just can't articulate that note slur it for crying out loud they just want to hear you sing your song and, and make it make it comfortable for you so that you that's what you can do and um, if it's too hard change it if you're playing someone else's cadenza and there's this part that always sounds bad oh my gosh take it out don't play that play something else or just just skip over it figure out how to skip over it Tell your story. You know the story, you know the order of details, you figured out the best way to deliver it, and you figured out how to effectively perform it your own way. That's what's more important. And I really think you can get there through um, the practice of memorization or using memorization in your practice. And now I'm gonna say again, the goal, I don't think the goal should be that you're gonna play it memorized because that's something. If you don't do it all the time, it's it's really something. And we, as wind players, are usually not required to play from memory. And um, uh, if, if someone's playing a new concerto or a new piece with an orchestra, they're using music. They're totally using music if it's, new, if it's a new piece. But if someone's playing Mozart, if David Jolly's playing Mozart, well, I, he, he won't use music, you know, because he's, he's amazing and um, um, he's a great soloist. But, so, 
using memorization as a practice tool is refreshing. It's different, probably something you never did before. It allows you to hear the sound and the music in a different way when the notes aren't in front of you. And um, it incorporates listening. That's a really big important as part of the practice. You know, if you're if you're practicing for a half an hour and you listen for seven minutes really hard on something on what you're working on, that's practicing. That is all part of it because it's all about the music. Um, um, and it incorporates listening to music, but it also incorporates you really listening to yourself when you're playing um, from memory. You learn intervals better. Sometimes you 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 play and you're like, God, I always miss that note. You go, Oh my God. That's just a major third. Oh, I was way overshooting it. That just, that's just, you know, B to D sharp. Oh, I know what that sounds like. You know, sometimes you just, just because you heard it, you went, oh, and then you make the connection and then never again you'll, you'll miss those, those notes or whatever. Um, uh, you make better connections. If you make better connections like that, guess what? Your accuracy improves. Yay, we all want our accuracy to improve. And better accuracy means you're thinking less about the notes and you have the mental space to listen and actually tell your story. I know it by heart. The end. There it is. There's my talk. Are there any questions or anything? Or um, I don't know how we end these. How do we end these little tidbits? No, that was wonderful. Uh, oh, I didn't have the chat open. I wasn't looking at that. No, so that's later. fine. There's been a lot of really lovely chat. Uh, traffic that's not the word i'm looking for but a lot of chat comments today so that's been really great if you all have any questions for pat on this like please go ahead and stick them in the chat but pat this was awesome i oh, really great. enjoyed it and i think everybody here did too i don't want to speak for everyone but it seems seems to be well received so awesome. thank you You're welcome. um You're welcome. great uh let's see so again, if there are any questions for Pat, you're more than welcome to go ahead and stick them in the chat. If not, that's totally okay. But keep your eyes open. Yeah, keep your keep your eyes open. Yeah. That seems like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never thought about that before of oh, making it a presentation, but now that <coughs> now that I've yeah, glass has been shattered, and yeah. now I uh, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to do that again, which is fine. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. New Hampshire allergies up here. All right. Oh, lots of stuff about the book. Yeah, definitely read that book, you guys. It's, 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 it's great. It's a hoot. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. It was really great to, um, to be able to do this, and I hope you all have a great, wonderful day. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pat. All right. Uh, I meet myself. <laughs> All good. Okay. That works. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you again for attending the session of Horn Camp Connect live from KBHC 2022. Uh, Pat, thank you again for being here today and giving such a lively and engaging presentation. It was awesome. Uh, if you would like to review this session, you are welcome to do so on our YouTube page, which you should all have many, many, many links to now. Um, and if you have any questions for Pat that you think of later, you can email them to me directly at elizabeth at horncamp.org and I will do my best to shuffle them on over to Pat this week while we're here. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube and have any questions, you're welcome to leave uh, comments in the chat on, or not comments in the chat, your questions in the comments. I'm way too much in Zoom mode right now, uh, but you're welcome to do that there. And uh, yeah, as you all know, we have a t-shirt fundraiser going on that's just for commemorating the first couple of years of Horn Camp Connect. And um, that's at Custom Inc. And it will be linked to two in our uh, end of day email today. Uh, and let's see, I've lost my script, I'm sorry. Tomorrow morning, you can join us again at 8 a.m. Eastern for the next edition of Horn Camp Connect live from KBHC should feature Katie Ambrose, I think, tomorrow morning presenting her presentation um, on, I think, African-American horn players in the early, early Americas, I think. So 
should be really interesting. I probably got that title wrong. Please forgive me, but we'll see you tomorrow morning. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good day. See you soon.